This is Greg Troutwein, Maritime Reporter TV. And we're very pleased to be joined today by Panos Koutsarakis, Vice President of Global Sustainability for the American Bureau of Shipping. Panos, first and foremost, very nice to join, for, to have you join us again. Thank you, Greg, for the opportunity. I know that ABS has just uh, published their 2024 outlook looking at the carbon neutral in the maritime industry. Can you give us uh, some overriding, uh, some key findings from the report? Yes. I think this, this year is uh, the sixth year that we do this annual outlook. We have done a lot of re-engineering this time. We have incorporated many additional variables because everything is changing. It's so dynamic and we have to update all the findings consistently every year. So I would say three of the most important findings that we have for our outlook is that, first of all, we have noticed a significant shift to the alternative fuels. And what I mean with that is that from the analysis we found that uh, the new orders in terms of tonnage, almost half of the new tonnage is going to have dual fuel engines. So we see more and more ships moving to that direction. The second finding is about um, the shipyards. Uh, the major shipbuilding countries, like uh, in Asia, we have Korea, Japan, China. Um, we have, of course, some others in Europe that they do new buildings. And we're expecting to be high demand because of this energy transition. More ships will be ordered. However, we're expecting that the capacity of the shipbuilding, of the new building yards, is going to be increased moderately, about 5%. However, this additional demand is going to be covered by emerging builders. So we're expecting to see Vietnam, India, Middle East, Philippines to come over you know, to assist for this additional demand. The third finding is about the IMO checkpoints. Recently, IMO released the new strategy we have a new checkpoint by 2030 and another checkpoint by 2040. And of course, we have the ultimate target to reach the decarbonization by 2050. So for about 2030, when we did the analysis, we found that the industry, the shipping industry, it might be feasible to meet this target. However, for 2040, it's going to be challenging. And roughly, in order to meet the 2040 checkpoint, all of, we may need about one-third of the global fleet, the existing fleet, to be retrofitted with dual fuel uh, engines. These are the three main findings for our outlook. Okay. Well, these are, these are certainly challenging times, but they're certainly exciting times as well. Yes. The outlook uh, pointed out that carbon capture yes. uh, could and should have a significant role in this. Uh, carbon capture is obviously developing. Can you give us a status and an update on how you see it? Yeah, car carbon capture is going to be a very important technology, uh, you know, while we're moving towards the energy transition. We need the carbon capture. As a technology, I would say that is quite mature. Uh, we know the carbon capture, it has been on shore for quite a long time. So we know. Now the, what we're trying to do is, you know, to fit our experience on this technology, to fit that on board. So there are several pilot projects, we see several ship owners testing, getting results, trying to, to, to size in properly this equipment to fit, you know, for the vessel. But apart from this, I would say what is the main challenge is the infrastructure. As with fuels, same with the carbon capture. When we capture the carbon, we have to store on board. Storing that on board, of course, we have to dispose or to sequestrate. So this kind of infrastructure is under development, and of course there is a lot of debate about the uh, secondary market. You know, if you dispose, you know, on shore, you know, is there a secondary market, you know, for some cases to re regenerate using this carbon capture um, for, other, uh, for other products, you know, how you can generate credits, and the whole idea is how to minimize the cost of using carbon capture. I've been to several presentations from ABS this week and I've heard Chris Wiernicki say on multiple occasions that the fuel is 70% of what is eventually going to be the, the fight to decarbonize and, and cut emissions. Um, as you know, green fuels are a potential barrier point um, as there are other industries that are going to be demanding these fuels. So when you look at fuel 
in fuel availability, what do you see? Ah, that's that's such a very good question. Um, first of all, I would start a bit about the fuel mix, some analysis that we did. The projections that we have is that, first of all, oil-based fuels will be around by 2050, will not be disappeared. And of course, we're going to build up and having the alternative fuels, methanol, ammonia, and let's say in smaller quantities or volumes, hydrogen. Now, at this moment, IMO, the main focus was till now to tank to wake approach, but now it's moving to the life cycle approach. So as you mentioned, the green fuels will play a substantial role because we see across the value chain of this fuels production. So now the infrastructure, it, it's something that we have to investigate a bit more. We have to incentivize the society and definitely I feel that we need government support. To, to start a business for something which the demand is uncertain, you need the governments to incentivize you. They need to subsidize, you know, and start rolling out, you know, a new business. The demand is, is coming, we see that. But how to secure the demand since you have a new fuel production facility, green fuel production facility, since you have adequate demand to cover all your operational costs, all your capex costs, it will take some time. There is where we need the governments to, to come in. Now, how fast this infrastructure is going to be developed, I think that there are many different variables. Because on the one part, there are some technical analysis, technical economic analysis, and we see, let's say, the cost of to abate the carbon using alternative fuels is high at this moment. This is a technical approach, but there is also commercial and political approach. In some countries, there are some government decisions they have decided to use this kind of fuel. Some other countries, they're deciding to use another kind. That depends because of their location. That depends because of intergovernmental uh, agreements with other uh, countries. So I would say that it's quite complicated. And at this moment, I'm not sure that we have a straightforward answer you know, about the future um, availability of the fuels.